units of the National Guard have been and are now being mobilized with the mission to maintain or restore the peace and good order of this community. I think they'll get in here, but I don't know how long they'll live after they do get in here. Let's stand together, and we will not be defeated. May of 1954, by order of the U.S. Supreme Court, all public schools in America must accept children of all races. It was a ruling that didn't sit well with many white Americans, and segregationists from near and far came to Little Rock and our state capitol prepared to fight. The unrest that was brought about by the effort to integrate public schools not only affected students, but other young people who were thrust into a tense situation just because they were doing their job. Now, 50 years later, have things really changed? Have bigotry and prejudice been set aside? There may be diversity in every classroom, but is each child getting an equal education? Many people over the age of 50 remember a time when there were separate water fountains and restaurants, even waiting rooms for black and white Americans. So when the U.S. Supreme Court ordered public schools to integrate, it was a ruling that many people just couldn't accept and it was an issue that became very political. Built in 1927 at a cost of a million and a half dollars, Central High was the most expensive high school ever built. The National Association of Architects named it America's most beautiful high school. Four statues of Greek goddesses, ambition, personality, opportunity, and preparation adorn the front of the school. Thirty years later, each of those traits of character would be challenged by the events of one Supreme Court decision. On May 17, 1954, the United States Supreme Court ruled racial segregation in schools unconstitutional. A year later, the Little Rock School Board created the Blossom Plan, a six-year plan to gradually integrate public schools. It would begin with the integration of Central in 1957. I mean, fight! <laughs> Segregationists fought the plan. They filed lawsuits to stop integration, but were not successful. Just weeks before school was to start, Arkansas Governor Orville Faubus, citing the potential for violence, called in the National Guard to prevent the black students from entering Central. I have therefore taken the following action. Units of the National Guard have been and are now being mobilized with the mission to maintain or restore the peace and good order of this community. Daisy Bates was president of Little Rock's NAACP. The day before school was to begin, she tried to get in touch with the nine to ask them to meet three blocks from school. They would walk to school together. But Elizabeth Eckford didn't have a phone, and all alone she faced an angry crowd. The next day, the nine tried to go to school again, and again, a mob of angry people chased them away. I think they'll get in here, but I don't know how long they'll live after they do get in here. On September 23rd, crowds began to gather around Central High School, curious and tense. Local police decided the nine black students were in danger. The students were escorted from the campus. For the moment, that school belonged to the crowd. That night, on national television, President Eisenhower called the rioting disgraceful and ordered the 101st Airborne Division to escort the group into the school. Two days later, on September 25th, 1957, the Little Rock Nine were escorted back into Central High School for their first full day of classes. Did any of the Little Rock Nine know the significance of what they were doing 50 years ago? After all, other parts of the state had already integrated their schools. What made Central High so different? Was it any wonder that a young girl looking forward to her first day at Central would be taken aback by crowds of angry people and soldiers with bayonets? Stephanie Bryant sat down with that young girl who has come a long way from that day back in 1957. It's this image of a shy 15-year-old Elizabeth Eckford walking alone through a screaming mob in front of Central High that plunged nine students into the forefront of the civil rights movement and brought international attention to Little Rock. It was a very terrifying day. Five decades later, and those tense moments are still hard for Eckford to relive. I, I um, got off the bus two blocks from the school. I was very familiar with Central High School because I had to pass it going to all the other schools I had attended. 
could hear the murmur of a crowd. But as I approached the school, I saw that they were across the street and that soldiers were ringing the grounds of Central High School. I thought that the soldiers would protect all students. But she would later learn those troops weren't there to protect them, but to keep the nine from getting in. In fact, the soldiers, at my third attempt to get onto the school grounds, the soldier, soldier directed me across the street where those angry people were. Uh, when I stepped out into the street, they, they uh, pressed toward me and continued to follow me. Well, I know it sounds ridiculous now, but I concentrated on getting to the bus stop. That meant safety for me. But she says whether they knew it or not, it was the media who protected them from harm. When I see the pictures now, I realize that immediately behind the bench where I was sitting, there were local reporters who were a physical barrier between me and the crowd. For the rest of that school year. The um, hara verbal harassment was from beginning to end and the physical assaults were from beginning to end. Eckford and the others would be the brunt of racial strife. She says she hoped things would get better. So for most of the time I was in Central, I was very, very lonely. But they never did. Eckford would leave the state never to return for years. She served a stint in the U.S. Army, but it was the love of her family that would bring her back home. She never forgot what happened. But for, for, but for most of us, it, it was we didn't talk about uh, our experiences in school for 25 to 30 years. And during the state's 40th commemoration of the integration of Central High, Eckford admits she had not let go of the past. It was very difficult for me to do interviews, but I felt obligated because I was the only one of the nine here. Even after accepting the apology from Hazel Bryan Masary, the woman whose hateful face became an icon for the emotions of that moment in time. I just apologized to her. I, we were both crying. It was after a 12-week racial healing class in 1999 that Eckford could finally put the anger aside. I struggled to walk through the past, and it took a long time for me to get reach the point where I am now. Through the years, Eckford and the others would receive prestigious awards and recognition for their courageous efforts in 57. But it was the unveiling of the Nine's bronze statues on the state's Capitol grounds where Eckford says she's most proudest. That was one of the, um, the happiest experiences I've had in Little Rock, because I never expected that, um, that it would actually happen, that there would be statues uh, of living people, first of all, uh, and that, that, that these statues would be placed on the, on the state capitol grounds. And as the state prepares for the 50th commemoration of the Central High Crisis, Eckford says she's come full circle. Well, it's the last hoorah for 65 and 66 year olds. <laughs> Nine may have made it through the doors of Central High School, but were they ready for what was waiting for them on the other side? When we come back, we'll hear what some of them have to say. Central High, 50 years, Foundations of Freedom, brought to you by Emerald Mountain Development. I had no idea that it would be this important. I knew, was, I knew it was big, but I had no idea they would do all this. It took several attempts for the Little Rock Nine to actually get to a classroom, much less learn anything those first few weeks. They were cussed at, spat on, and taunted. One of the nine, Thelma Mothershed, suffered from a serious heart condition. Her decision to attend Central High had more to do with finding a school within walking distance of her home than becoming a changing force in this country's history. They sent a note about to Horace Bain when I was a 10th grader, and the teachers made it, anybody who wants to transfer to Central, just stand up. I signed my name. Melba and Minnie Jean, our good friends, so all three of us signed up to go to Central. When I came on that afternoon and told mother, I signed up to go to Central. She said, are you crazy? Thelma blames then-Governor Orville Faubus for the friction that turned Little Rock into a national spectacle. Faubus later said he did what he had to do to be re-elected. Thelma says present-day governors need only look out their office window to be reminded that the spirit of the Little Rock Nine watches over every decision he or she makes. Ernest Green was the only senior among the nine. His mother was a teacher and a member of the NAACP, so he was very aware of the civil rights movement. 
In fact, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. served as inspirations to him. Now his journey through prejudice and strife have made him a role model to those who have followed. Thanks. Ernest Green sits behind his desk at Lehman Brothers in Washington, D.C. It's a long way from Little Rock, although no matter where Ernest is, the topic of Little Rock Central High always comes up. He says the day they finally made it inside, he was surprised when halfway through the day, soldiers arrived at his classroom to escort him out. When we got home that day, after being there, I was really shocked that they were so violent because I couldn't, I couldn't hear the noise in the classes that I was in. In fact, when they first came to get me, I thought it was another ruse. I was very upset that I was not going to be able to complete a full day at Central High School. And I was really worried about uh, my work because here I was again <laughs> my senior year. I didn't want to fall further behind and uh, not be competitive. Anyway, we got home that night and that's when uh, the next day President Eisenhower announced he was sending in the 101st Airborne. Ernest says very few white classmates tried to be his friend. Any white student who uh, tried to befriend us, uh, they were threatened as well. They were threatened that, that homes were called, that, that parents' businesses were threatened to be boycotted. So He made it through his senior year and was ready to graduate. Because of threats on his life, Principal Jess Matthews offered to mail his diploma. It's all right that you don't have to participate in the ceremony. And it took me about two-tenths of a millisecond <laughs> to respond that, uh, you know, I was going to be there. Uh, I was going to soak up all of it, the ceremony included, and uh, plan to march uh, with my with my classmates. Ernest stood alone as the students lined up to march into the football stadium, but there in the stadium was his family and a very special guest, Martin Luther King Jr. I didn't know he was there until the end of the ceremony. He had, uh, uh, he sat with my mother and my aunt, uh, my grandfather, uh, when I received my diploma and then afterwards we had a chance to uh, uh, talk and spend a little time before he uh, left Little Rock. Ernest surrounds himself with pictures and documents that remind him of how far he's come, and he'll be among the first to say, we still have a long way to go. Carlotta Walls was the youngest of the Little Rock Nine, despite the fact that Governor Orville Faubus closed all public schools for the 1958 school year, Carlotta returned to Central in 59 and graduated in 1960. It was the excitement of, of going to a high school. and going to my neighborhood high school and to a high school that was known by the American Architects Association, the most beautiful high school in the country. Being accepted at Central was a proud moment for Carlotta and her entire family. It's fall, it's time to go to school, and my uncle had purchased me a dress for a first day of school. My mother was an expert seamstress and she normally made a lot of my clothes, but he this was a great uncle, and he said to my mother, I, um, she's going off to Central High School, and I want you to go downtown and buy her a new dress, her first day uh, uh, outfit. On that first day, when she saw and heard the angry crowd, she didn't respond. I had always been taught that you, uh, you know, you do not stoop to that level. Um, either you help bring people up to your level, or you ignore it and as that day and many days went on um, I saw the ignorance of people and that's how I approached it. Carlotta had dreams of becoming a doctor. That dream is what led her to Central. Well I didn't go to school to sit next to a white person okay as much as I like white people, brown people, I, I, you know um, that, that was not the goal whatsoever. As much as I like them, I don't get a buzz sitting next to them, so. Especially when one of them made her life miserable on a daily basis. I remembered one person who loved to walk on the back of my heels, even though I had the 101st guardsman walking, you know, who, who escorted me from classroom to classroom. And that it, it, it had become a job for her, that this was going to be, I was going to be the one that she was going to antagonize every day, okay? 
So I learned, I had different defense mechanisms. And the one I had decided for her is that I would walk fast. And if you're going to walk on the back of my heels, you're going to work for it. Today, living in Denver, Colorado, Carlotta enjoys sharing her story with youngsters. She sees the surprise in their eyes when she talks about what the Little Rock Nine went through. And even though she has a string of accomplishments and awards, there's one she likes to take with her when she speaks. I don't think that they're going to meet too many people that have received a Congressional Gold Medal, and that, that was a biggie for me. President Bill Clinton awarded Carlotta and the other nine with the Congressional Gold Medal in 1999. The other Little Rock Nine include Melba Patillo Beals. At the age of 17, she began writing articles for major magazines and newspapers. She earned her master's in journalism. She has worked as a television reporter and has written several books. Her bestseller, Warriors Don't Cry, is about her experiences at Central. Melba now lives in California. Gloria Ray Karlmark was a sophomore in 57. When Faubus closed the schools in 1958, in an attempt to stop integration, she moved to Missouri to finish school. Ironically, it was at a newly integrated school that was also called Central. She earned a college degree in chemistry and mathematics and now lives in the Netherlands. Dr. Terrence Roberts began Central as a junior. When schools closed in 58, Roberts transferred to Los Angeles High School. He earned a bachelor's in sociology at California State University and his master's in social welfare from UCLA. Dr. Roberts went on to get his Ph.D. in psychology from Southern Illinois University. Jefferson Thomas was a track star at All Black Horse Man before deciding to attend Central. Because of the angry mobs, the Little Rock Nine agreed to not take part in extracurricular activities. For Jefferson, that meant no track, but his quickness often helped him avoid attempts from other students to hit or shove him. Thomas became an accountant and at one time worked for the U.S. Department of Defense. Minnie Jean Brown Tricky was a junior her first year at Central. Several times she was picked on. She fought back, leading to several suspensions, and eventually she was expelled. Minnie Jean graduated from a high school in New York and went on to earn her bachelor and her master's in social work. She served in the Clinton administration as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Workforce Diversity at the Department of Interior. The National Guard was there to prevent the Nine from entering Central in the first few days, but were later called back to protect them. We'll visit with two of them when we come back. And during all the uncertainty surrounding the integration of Central High School, there were two people the Little Rock Nine and their parents turned to. We'll hear more about Elsie and Daisy Bates when we come back. As president of the state NAACP, Daisy Bates helped coordinate the integration of Central High School. She and her husband, LC, used their home as a meeting place for the Little Rock Nine. Oftentimes, they paid the price. Once again, here's Stephanie Bryant. I, I find her to be one of the most remarkable people ever to come out of Arkansas or the South. That was one of the reasons Little Rock attorney Griff Stockley chose Bates as the subject of his last book titled Daisy Bates, Civil Rights Crusader from Arkansas. When I started looking around for another book to write, I found that no one had done a full-scale adult biography of Daisy Bates by that time. And she was more significant than people realized. In the early 40s, Daisy and her husband, L.C., were publishers of the Arkansas State Press, a newspaper dealing primarily with civil rights issues. Over the years, Daisy would establish a name for herself, becoming president of the Arkansas NAACP. Let's stand together! That position grew more prominent as Little Rock and nine black students were thrust into the forefront of the civil rights movement. Daisy and Elsie Bates would pay the price as mentor and advisor to the nine. I mean, there were uh, repeated threats, shots fired into the house, cross burnings, rocks thrown into the house. Stockley says Daisy knew how to work the press to her advantage. She was a very good spokesman. She presented well in public. She was a very attractive, well-dressed, warm personality who could humanize what was going on. She relied, she knew what she didn't know, and she relied on her husband. She relied on Chris Mercer, who was a lawyer, to explain 
the legal uh, ramifications of what was going on during the 57 crisis. After Central High's integration, Daisy would continue to work in the movement, working for Presidents John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and others. She even penned an autobiography in the long shadow of Little Rock. In 1999, the civil rights icon would die at the age of 84, a week before her birthday. Every other year, the NAACP hosts the Daisy Bates Education Summit, which addresses issues in our nation's public schools. The Arkansas National Guard also played a key role in the Central High Crisis. First, Governor Orville Faubus mobilized the Guard to keep the nine out, but President Eisenhower federalized the troops to keep them in. One of those soldiers by their side every day now realizes just how brave the nine really were. Roger Vaughn likes to keep up on current events. We are fighting for democracy. But 50 years ago, he was making headlines. See, when they're walking up through there, we're walking with them. When he was thrust into the spotlight of the Central High Crisis. It was, it was, it was a lot of hatred there. You could tell that with people that didn't want to go. The year 1957, nine African-American students wanted to get an education at Little Rock Central High School. Now here we are, right there. Got to be us, bring, is that us come bring them back out? Vaughn was one of six National Guardsmen from Searcy sent in to make sure they got there safely. Our job was to drive right behind them and I was in Jeep behind them with us four of us and we go down to, I think it was the Green's house every morning and pick them up. Vaughn says they even practiced in case of ambush. Well, I can remember it now. I, I, it, some of it flashes back like all them kids and this, and this forcing them to stay on the other side. His colonel's words still ring through his head today. I'm gonna tell you how important it is, important it is to protect them. Said if you saw a rock coming, there's no other way you can stop it but stick your head in front of it, stick your head in front of it. More than once, soldiers had to step into the line of fire. Chaos when we got to the school now, because it was uh, uh, hundreds, I'd say four or five hundred people across the street. They wouldn't let them. The 101 Airborne was in front of the school, uh, arm, I mean, shoulder to shoulder, and you couldn't some of the crowd tried to rush him. One of them grabbed one of the one of the rifle, and he took the rifle and popped him upside the head and knocked him to the ground. The soldiers endured some of the same torment as the nine. Of course, they were there was there was hassled and everything. I didn't, you know, you didn't like that, and I didn't like them hassling us. So many of them, some of them kids and things, they holler at us and say things to us. And I know they throw water balloon full of water on us a time or two. They may not have walked a mile in the Little Rock Nine's shoes, but some soldiers, like Roger Vaughn, walked right beside them. I just asked them if they remembered us coming to get them, and I was one of them, and, and uh, tell them I'm proud of them for what they was able to accomplish. Another guardsman who witnessed the chaos had no idea he was making history too. Strictly chaos, but it was it was like a world of wonder to me. Ed Hammontree was just a kid himself when his captain called for volunteers to head to Central High. At 18 years old, he guarded the school and the football stadium. We had two black families in the whole Benton County, and the greatest people in the world got down here on that side of the streets where all the students and, and the protesters and the, mostly the guys that graduated the preceding two years were ranting and raving. Hammontree says he never talked to the Little Rock Nine, but two stood out. Ernest Green, he says, was a nice guy. Minnie Jean Brown Tricky, he says, outspoken. The fight to stop integration had been going on for years, but when the events of September of 1957 unfolded, even some members of the media were shocked. We'll hear from some of them when we return. Melba and the other Negro students attending Central High go to school in a very unusual way yet. They meet here and are conducted to school by the Army to make sure of their safety. Melba, how do you feel about going to school on this second day? I feel pretty good about it, but I pray more than anybody you've ever heard of before. The way we cover the news has really changed since 1957. Back then, we shot on film and in black and white. There were no digital cameras, no cell phones, no computers. Reporters did what they had to to get the story. 
Many of the pictures that come to mind when we think of that day in 1957 were captured by the lens of Will Counts. The 26-year-old photographer for the Arkansas Democrat newspaper had graduated from Central, so he knew the campus well. His editors simply sent him to cover whatever happened. His photographs of Elizabeth Eckford would become the defining images of that time. But as a news picture, I think this is important because it really shows what the guard was doing. They're letting the white, the white girl pass through the lines while Elizabeth is being turned away. Journalists brought the story to people across the country through their photographs and their words. Some people claim certain members of the press manipulated the facts to fit their own agendas. It was a charge voiced by Governor Orville Faubus himself on Face the Nation. I was merely trying to keep the peace and prevent injury and death and destruction. But the press assumed that I had a contrary viewpoint, and uh, they attempted, for the most part, to do me harm. One of my greatest memories is how naive I must have been. Local journalists Herbie Bird and Phyllis Brandon were at Central High that morning. Randy Tardy was manning the microphone at a radio station in Helena. All three recall being surprised by the interest of the national media. And I thought, what in the world are they doing here? And how did they get here and why? There was Life and Time and the New York Times. And I, as a young fella, uh, fairly naive. I was stunned by that. Brandon also graduated from Central. I was uh, uh, just out of college, and uh, so their plan was that I should go to Central High the day that the black students were there and uh, dress like a student and get in the school. But the National Guard stopped her at the door. I said, can I even go to my locker? And they said no. So I stayed and covered the mall. Her account became her first front page byline. It was, um, it was really a mob and scary. When I walked up to him after parking my car a couple of blocks away, I heard a man say, let's go get our gun. When the violence erupted, Brandon and Bird recall thinking the people surrounding them weren't necessarily from the area. Uh, an, another impression that I, that, I, that I carry from back in, at, at that first morning is that I thought these folks who are here, number one, need, need something to do. They, they have no business here. And uh, number two, I can't believe these are typical Little Rock area residents. Bird was broadcasting from the scene for radio station KLRA. Live radio was in its infancy, so that broadcast was never recorded. Meanwhile, Tardy left radio to work at this TV station. And I left Channel 11 a few years after I came here to go with the Little Rock Chamber of Commerce, so I got to see kind of firsthand the black eye that Little Rock had because we went several years without getting any, uh, any industry whatsoever. And I believe the jacuzzi plant was the first one, and that was about three or four years after uh, after that. While business may be booming now, the echoes of the Central High Crisis still reverberate through Arkansas. And suddenly we were on the front page of the world, and when that happens to, uh, to a community, particularly if you're the capital city of a state, uh, it, it, it stays around for a long, long time. But the history was there, and, and it, it was a tragic episode, and uh, I wish it hadn't happened. All three agree the scars of that day are still very much visible. I'm really sad that it's happening in the 50th year of the anniversary of Central High. Um, I think, you know, there's some tensions there that, that uh, I had hoped would be healed and haven't. Societal wounds that surfaced a half century ago still making headlines today. Personally, this is discrimination. I will stand firm. This is a, an attack against a black woman. Despite the violence going on outside Central High School in 1957, there was one group of students focusing on a mission, trying to keep themselves the most dominant team in the entire country, at least on the football field. What's it like attending Little Rock Central High School today? Well, we'll talk to some current students when we come back. So what if there had been no Little Rock Nine? If Little Rock Central had been allowed to integrate peacefully without national media attention or protest? Chances are the class of 57 from Central still would be famous, not because of the Little Rock Nine, but because of the Central 33. They were the most accomplished, talented, and feared high school football team in America. 
The 57 Tigers were the latest in a line of dominant teams that hadn't lost a game in almost two years. They were led by a demanding, tough, unwavering coach named Wilson Matthews. It was, it was, it was some, it was a lot of pride there, but, but it was Wilson Matthews. It was really the, <laughs> the, the spirit behind the whole team. And it was this coach who kept Bill May and his teammates focused when the mobs, the military, and the media came to town. He was uh, more or less kind of a god to all of us, and, uh, and that's one reason uh, that. We, we got through that integration the first two weeks. Billy Moore quarterbacked that team and All-American for the Razorbacks. He honed his skills in the shadow of national headlines. Well, we had a, uh, we had a uh, coach that said we had nothing to do with what's going on, you know. And we had better tend to our football and classes or he was going to kick our ass off the team. Matthews was so dominant, he even intimidated the 101st Airborne. When we were out actually practicing out there, and they were trying to come in and land in an area where, where part of us were, were working out, and we had different drills going on. And Coach Matthews, you know, just when he threw his hat sideways, you knew he was mad, and he took his clipboard and threw it at the helicopter, and the helicopter veered off. Later, the 101st Airborne would even become Central High School fans. And they were all out there in force. They were up, had their own cheering section and everything else. As these men look back on their youth, they don't remember September of 57 as the beginning of a social and cultural upheaval. You don't look at the news. You don't care. You know, you're in your own clique when you're 15, 16, and 17 years old. You would go home in the evenings and watch television on the national coverage and, and you were wondering, you know, well, what, who, who, who are they talking about? Somehow, through it all, the 57 Tigers went undefeated. They beat the Louisiana State champions. No one came close to them. They don't seem to mind being a football footnote. They admire the Little Rock Nine and the change that was brought about, especially in athletics. That 1957 Central High School football team belongs on this special, celebrating the 50th anniversary of integration at Central High, because it points up the resiliency of youth, that even despite all the protest and the national headlines, Central could still produce a champion. We've heard a lot from Central High's class of 57-58, but now a snapshot of life at Central High School today. Tiger pride still very much alive through the students here. And we asked if much has changed in the past 50 years, and their answer, yes and no. These are the faces. We're setting example as seniors. And voices. It's neat to see how much progress has been made here. Of Central High School today. It's very exciting being a senior and celebrating such a historic event. They're part of history, but don't tell them that. This is natural to us. This is what we do every single day. It, we don't think of it as like central, the no, historic side. We just think of it as a high school. Yeah. <laughs> Still, 50 years later, with the eyes of the world watching, it is hard for these students to forget this. The bravery and courage, they call it, of the Little Rock Nine. You know, 15 and 16 years old, same age as we are now, entering Central and making such a, a big step. It just, it's just amazing how they walk through the doors with um, just such a strong face and how they, I mean, you never saw them shed a tear. You just saw them face everything. And I could, I would have run crying. I couldn't have done it. <laughs> it's a really big deal. And we're very thankful for that. This group knows the reason they're able to now walk Central's diverse hallways, to talk and socialize with whomever they wish, is a gift from the nine black students who integrated their high school. Does it make you angry when you think about how they were treated? And, you know, there's some pictures of other students yelling at them, and um, they each have their own stories of how they were treated poorly. It doesn't make us angry. It just shows us where we have come from. And we've learned from that, so it's not an angry thing, it's more of an appreciative moment than being angry. They also know they are very much in the national spotlight, as was the class of 57-58, but this time for far different reasons. And sometimes they say 
that feels like pressure. So, you know, Central High School, you're supposed to be so perfect and, you know, yeah. supposed to walk down the hallway with every race and hold hands and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like that. We're supposed to break down crying every yeah. day. It's just I mean, like, we get, it's like we get criticized a lot because we don't have the, the reaction every single day that people think that we should have. Well, it's just it's just school. You know, yeah, after yeah. after you get over, you know, what happened fifty years ago, we're still a working school. Other than us being a historical site, it's still just a school. A school that's still working toward change. It's not perfect here according to this group. But I still think that there are some barriers um, that have yet to be broken. They can be segregated and a mix. Like sometimes you can go in and eat lunch with whoever you want to, and sometimes you might just want to hang out with an exclusive set of people. And I don't feel like it's a central thing. I feel like it's like a national thing. Like I don't feel like um, the nation's progressed and central's progressed, but there's still a long way that both can, um, you know, even further progress. Our administration has a lot of programs to help us with that. Like Unitown is something they do every year where they kids apply to go and hang out with um, people of different ethnicities and races. And Something they know wouldn't be possible if it weren't for the Little Rock Nine. On this anniversary, a history lesson not taught in a classroom, but one these students are living firsthand. <laughs> it kind of brought up all back home, like why we go to school here every day, how important it is for us to remember what they did do for us, so it's so awesome. None of this would be possible if it weren't for Little Rock Nine, not just at Central, but anywhere. One of those students had the chance to meet Melba Beals. Another met Thelma Mothershed. Now, when I asked them if they had anything they'd like to say to the Little Rock Nine, it was an easy answer. A great big thank you. We'll wrap things up when we come back. Everyone has his or her own opinion about the way the integration of Central High was handled, and many say we still have work to do. Students at Central High School today say thank you to all members of the class of 5758, for without the trials and tribulations they endured, their world would not be as diverse as it is today. We salute all those who helped bring us to where we are today, not just the Little Rock Nine, but all brave students and their families in cities like North Little Rock, Fayetteville, Hoxie, Van Buren, and Charleston. Thank you for taking this journey back in time with us as we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the integration of Little Rock Central High.